All right, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Welcome to those who are joining us live as we just had our Torah processional, which was wonderful, and now we get to read Torah and study together. Today's portion comes from Genesis chapter 41, Bereshit 41.1, uh, Parashat Miketz. And we're going to, before we read the Hebrew, we're going to go ahead and recite the blessing. So join me as we recite the blessing. Baruchu et Adonai Amevorach. Baruch Adonai Amevorach Leolam Vaed. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam. Asher Bekar Banu Mikol Haamim. Venetan Lanu Et Torato. Baruch Ata Adonai. No ten haTorah, Amen. Bless Adonai who is blessed. Blessed is Adonai who is blessed forever and ever. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, who selected us from all the nations and gave us His Torah. Blessed are you, Adonai, Giver of the Torah, Amen, and Amen. Please remain standing for the Hebrew reading. And it says in the Hebrew, Genesis 41, 1 through 3, it says, Vayahi miketz shenataim, yamim ofaro, cholem vichene omed al chayeor. Vahine min chayeor olot sheva. Paro yefot mare u veriot basar veterena baahu. Baahu, excuse me. Vahine sheva parot ashevot asherot alot aharehen min chayeor raot. Mare veta vedakot basar. Veta amodna etzel haparot al sfat ha yeor. Genesis forty one, verse one. And it came to pass. At the end of the two full years, that Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. And behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kine and fat-fleshed, and they fed in a meadow. And behold, seven other kine came up after them out of the river, ill-favored and lean-fleshed, and stood by the other kine upon the brink of the river. And the ill-favored and lean-fleshed kine did eat up the seven well-favored and fat kind. So Pharaoh awoke, and he slept and dreamed the second time. And behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good. And behold, seven thin ears and blasted with the east wind sprung up after them. And the seven thin ears devoured the seven rank and full ears. And Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof, and Pharaoh told them of his dream, but there was none that could interpret them unto Pharaoh. They spake, then spake the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. Pharaoh was wroth with his servants and put me inward in the captain of the guard's house, both me and the chief baker. And we dreamed a dream in one night, I and he. We dreamed each man according to the interpretation of his dream. And there was there with us a young man, a Hebrew, servant to the captain of the guard, and we told him, and he interpreted to us our dreams. To each man according to his dream he did interpret. And it came to pass, <coughs> as he interpreted to us, so it was. 
Me he restored unto mine office, and him he hanged. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they brought him hastily out of the dungeon, and he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. And now the closing blessing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Asher netan lanu Torah emet Vechayolam natan betochenu Baruch atah Adonai Noten haTorah Amen Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe. You have given us the Torah of truth and planted within us everlasting life. Blessed are you, Adonai, giver of the Torah. Amen and amen. Thank you, Michael. And thank you. Thank you, Rebbets and Stacy, for reading. So we made it to Parashat Miketz. The complete portion can be found in Bereshit Genesis 41.1 through 44.17. Last week's portion by Yeshev, and he continued living. We discussed Yaakov as he now lived in the land. We've seen his life and his, um, his story in the Torah portions. We've seen it all. We've seen it, um, his birth, his life, his feuds with his brother and his family and all these kind of things we've talked for the last few weeks. And last week, the portion started off and it quickly changed and started relating to the life of Joseph. And remember, we talked about the, um, the understanding of one verse that was in the middle of the chapter. It's Switches from Joseph's life, do you have to? Judy, you guys have to? Okay, okay. Those of you who are watching in TV land, let me pause for a second and pray for someone. All right. How many of you know that real life things happen even on Shabbat? Yeah. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, that as they drive home and he's able to get home and get some rest, we just thank you for bringing healing and full to him. We thank you for delivering him from this, oh God. We thank you for the good reports that he's improving, and we just continue to ask you for your blessing and help in the season of miracles, and we thank you for this in Yeshua's name. Amen and amen. All right, so... Back to what we were talking about last week's portion by Yashev. A lot about Yaakov. Then we get introduced to Joseph. And this is over the last few weeks. Get introduced to Joseph. And then right in the middle of the portion, we get to the story of Tamar and Yehuda. Then it switches back to Joseph. So we start this portion of Joseph. And this is one of those portions that are very well known. You know, people know about Joseph and his technicolor dream coat. And they know about Joseph and the famine and he's saving all the food. He has this idea, uh, we can save the food and do this. And this kind of connects to what we talked about earlier. Does any of you here believe that God wasn't using Joseph 
to save the known biblical world. Do any of you believe that Joseph just did something? He decided to do something that was totally disconnected to anything that God would want. No, and I'm bringing this up for a reason, to show you that it's always like this. It's never been God and men. No, it's always been God and men. It's always been like this. That's it. Always will be like this. This portion here, again, it's one that everyone seems to know. It's like Noah, you know, different ones. And I want to give you just a brief uh, overview of it, then I want to talk about one specific aspect of it. So in this portion, Joseph, Joseph finally gets out of prison when he interprets Pharaoh's dreams. Seven fat cows, seven skinny cows, depicting seven good years, followed by seven bad years. Pharaoh appoints Joseph governor over Egypt, Zaphnat Paneach. He has a plan to save food for the good, or from the good years in preparation for the famine. He marries Ashinath, the daughter of Potiphar, the daughter of the woman who tried to seduce him, Potiphar's wife, who was running from night matters, marries her daughter. I mean, that's a pretty interesting household situation um, where you have your mother, who ends up becoming your mother-in-law, tries to seduce you. You're married to her daughter. You know, but again, this scripture tells us the real deal. It's not trying to Joseph and his family, they were all so perfect. Doesn't tell us that. We don't see that. Tells us the real thing where we can actually relate to, oh, I know a situation. People are people, and that's what's wonderful about studying Torah is that you see that, and God uses them in spite of all of these things. They get married. They have two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Finally, the years of lack come. You know, it's nice when, you're, when things are in abundance and you're preparing for the years of lack. And when the years of lack come, not so much fun anymore. And people start descending on Egypt in search of food. Ten of Joseph's brothers come out, come to Egypt to purchase grain. For safety reasons, the youngest, Benjamin, stays home. Uh, we see Joseph recognizes his brothers, but they don't recognize him. The story of modern-day Christianity and Messiah Yeshua, which is a whole nother story. Why don't they recognize him? Because he's dressed up as a Gentile in Egyptian's clothing. And they've removed everything Hebrew about him. They don't recognize him anymore. Is he still their brother? Yes. Does he look like them anymore? No. God still uses him in spite of all of that. They don't recognize him. He accuses them of being spies. He makes a deal with them to bring back Benjamin to prove uh, that they are who they say they are. Uh, Shimon Simeon is in prison as a hostage. Later, they discover that the money they paid for the food had been mysteriously returned to them. The brothers come back. Joseph plants a silver goblet in the, uh, in the uh, Benjamin sack. The next day, Joseph goes after them, finds the goblet, and Joseph offers to set them free and retain only Benjamin as a slave. That's the bullet points of the whole portion. So a lot has happened in the portion and these last few portions regarding Joseph. And I want to do things a little different today. We've been doing things more, transitioning to more of a discussion. I want to have you guys think and be able to ask a question and comment and consider something in a different way than you have before. So I've got a few thoughts for you today. We didn't plan on this, but as we went through the prayers and we talked about this idea um, of the uh, of God's people constantly being overrun or uh, attempted you know every they're always on the brink of being eliminated but God always seems to find a way to save them and get them back and in general, they say, oh, we're sorry, we'll, can, we won't do that again. And then, you know, five minutes later, spiritually speaking, same kind of stuff is going on. Oh, but I'll never do that again, God. Okay, then five minutes later, same kind of stuff. So we see this, and they get to the brink, 
they repent and God, they come back miraculously, like in the time of the, the Hasmoneans, the time of Hanukkah. We see this story with Joseph sold into slavery by his brothers. He ends up in a pit. He ends up in a dungeon, a pit. The exact opposite of Hanukkah. Hanukkah, we celebrate the light and rejoicing. He's in a pit of darkness trying to get out. So I've got a few thoughts for you today. How much time does someone have to spend in a pit or darkness before he can be set free and be brought back into the light? How much time does the world have to spend in darkness before Hashem will intervene, send back Messiah? And does it matter or does it matter what's done in the darkness? Does it matter what's done in the times where we're in our lowest point? Does it matter? Yes, yes, it does. Does it count for anything? Does it count for anything, both the good and the bad? Yeah. How many of you have ever heard you come to know Messiah and you, know, you come to know Jesus and everything's going to be perfect? You know, you go out one night, your friend leads you to Jesus, you come home and them dead flowers in your, your, you know, your rose bush outside, they come back to life and the flowers are just, you know, those dirty dishes that have been sitting in the sink for a couple of days, they're washed and put away. You know, you're like 100 years old, but then all of a sudden you have the body of a 20-year-old. No. <laughs> Everything just turns perfect. I remember when I received Messiah, and it was a wonderful thing, and it wasn't long after that that things got really bad in my life. Probably some of the worst times of my life. But also, they were some of the best times because you know what? I remember going to, in junior high school and I had a little, someone had given me a little uh, Gideon's New Testament. And I used to carry it in my pocket. And when we would have tests and different things and people were studying, I would kind of pull it out, you know, and I'd kind of look at it and read it underneath the desk. And I remember just reading about Messiah. It just brought a warmth of, wow, okay, I can actually make it another day. You know what I'm talking about. The worst times in your lives are the times when what do you do? You turn to the Lord. You turn to Him. The darkest moments in the pit, all, need, all you need to turn on the light is one little matchstick. Yeah. There's a song in Meshuggah and Nutcracker we're going to watch tonight. And I'm not going to tell you all about it, but it's, Little matchstick, little matchstick, so small and so humble. That's all it takes. It's just that little bit. So how long does someone have to, let me read what I have written here. How, how much time does someone have to spend in a pit or darkness before he can be set free? How much time did Joseph have to spend in a pit and a darkness before he can be set free? A lot of time. I want to talk about this. We have read uh, this portion today, starting in chapter 40, but I want to really see what's going on here, what led up to this whole portion. We've got to backtrack a little bit and go back into the end of last week's portion. So I want to back up with you, and I want to read through Genesis chapter 40. Let's give you a second for those of you who want to uh, open your Bibles to it. Genesis, Genesis 40, yep, verse 1, Joseph interprets two prisoners' dreams. It says, Sometime later it came about that the Egyptian king's cupbearer and baker gave offense to their lord, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh became angry with his two officers of the chief, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. So he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison in the same place where Yosef was being kept. The captain of the guard charged Joseph, Yosef, to be with them, and he became their attendant while they remained in prison. So now he's like he's serving them in the jail. I, 
I, that's just nuts. One night, the two of them, the king of Egypt's cupbearer and his baker, there in prison, both had dreams, and each dream with its own meaning. Now, I want to just pause there just for a second. By show of hands, does anybody here believe that these dreams were just, oh, you know, they were just happenstance. He just happened to have a dream. You know, we would hear about these things. I remember someone, a pastor in the, back in the church days, used to say, yeah, that was a pizza and Pepsi prophecy. You know, this is a pizza and Pepsi dream. What did you eat last night before you went to bed? You know, what you eat will actually cause you to have different dreams or no dreams or that kind of thing. This wasn't the case. This is very specific dreams, very specific times, very specific people for a very specific interpreter of dreams to hear and interpret. You think Hashem was involved in this? Every bit of it. Verse 6, Yosef came into them in the morning and saw they looked sad. Oh, what's wrong with you guys? You guys, you worked in the palace. You were his servants. And now you're here and I'm, your, I'm serving you. You know, humility, you think when you're in prison, maybe a little humility would come upon you. But no, even, the, even the, this man, he's going to be your servant. In the prison cell. But look at his attitude. Verse 7, he asked Pharaoh's officers there with him in the prison of his master's house, why are you looking so sad today? They said to him, we each had a dream, and there's no one around who can interpret it. Yosef said to, to them, don't interpretations belong to God? Tell it to, tell it to me, please. Yosef knew where the interpretations belonged to. It belonged to God. I tell people this all the time, but a lot of them don't want to believe me. It's really true when Scripture says that the Jewish people had been called to be the oracles of God. As soon as you forget that and misplace that, you can have all kinds of stuff you believe. Here's another example of it right here. And this is uh, an interpretation of the dream. Then the chief cupbearer told Yosef his dream. In my dream, there in front of me was a vine, and the vine had three branches. The branches budded, and then it suddenly began to blossom. And finally, clusters of grapes appeared. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, so I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and gave the cup to Pharaoh. Yosef said to him, here's the interpretation. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office. You will be given Pharaoh his cup as you used to when you were his cup bearer. We know the rest of the story would happen as we just read some of it. But I'm saying all of that to get to this next verse, verse 40, 14. This is Joseph talking to him. But remember me when it goes well with you and show me kindness, please, and mention me to Pharaoh so that he will release me from this prison. Mm. The rabbis had a lot to say about that verse, and that's what I want to talk about today. Ah, let me, I want to read the rest of this too. Verse 15, but for the truth is that I was kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews, and here too I have done nothing wrong that would justify putting me in this dungeon. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Yosef, I too saw in my dream that there were three baskets of white bread on my head. In the uppermost basket, there were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh, but the birds ate them out of the basket on my head. Yosef answered, here is its interpretation. Three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you. He will hang you on a tree, and you birds will eat your flesh off of you. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he gave a party for all his officials, and he lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his officials. He restored the chief cupbearer back to his position that he again gave Pharaoh his cup. But he hanged the chief baker as Yosef had interpreted to them. 
Nevertheless, the chief cupbearer didn't remember Yosef, but forgot him. Why? He's out now. And this guy who interpreted my dream, he was serving. He was my servant too. And he was a Jew. He was a Hebrew. What a story. On one hand, he says, they're talking, and Joseph says to him, well, wait a minute, you're asking me about this dream. I'm telling you that the interpretation of dreams belong to God. I interpret the dream accurately, and you're alive today because of it, or I mean, not because of it, but you're alive today. And I ask you to do a couple things, and you just forget about it. You ever help somebody and ask them to do a couple little things, and they just forget about you? They forget all about you, and you're dying. You're just... Wasting away dying. He, he was still in prison. Do you think that the, um, the cupbearer knew he was in prison? Yeah, he knew he was still there. Remember, he was right there in the house. So I want to read about this a little bit in Midrash Rabbah and talk about this. I want to read something the rabbis had to say about this. This is concerning Joseph, but it's a whole lot deeper than this. Concerning this portion, the Midrash cites a passage from Job that it relates to this verse. It says that God sets a limit to the darkness. Remember the question I asked you, how long does someone have to stay in the pit? Listen to the rabbis discussed about this. God sets a limit to the darkness and he investigates the end to everything, the source of gloom and the shadow of death. Job 28, 3. The verse teaches that God fixed an amount of time for the world for how many years it would exist amid the darkness of the evil inclination. And what is the reason that God sets a limit to the darkness? Because as long as the evil inclination exists in the world, there is gloom and a shadow of death in the world. As it's written at the end of the verse regarding darkness, the source of gloom and the shadow of death. And once the evil inclination will be uprooted from the world, there will be no gloom and shadow of death in the world. We know this will happen when Messiah comes. We get this, underst we get this understanding that we've got a lot of gloom and darkness to live in for a little bit yet. So you may as well start acting like Joseph. You feel like you're living in the pit and start interpreting dreams for people or start looking to keep your connection with God regardless of what's going on. Remember, Scripture says, a thousand may fall at my side and 10,000 at my right hand, but it shall not come near me. Well, he just saw, he told the guy, hey, you're going to be dead in three days. And you're going to be alive in three days. Can you help me? And he didn't help him. I'm back in the pit again by myself, but God is still here. He's still talking to me and showing me things that give me understanding that perhaps I wouldn't even have if I wasn't here in the pit. And that's a whole other discussion I don't want to even get into right now. Once the evil inclination will be uprooted from the world, there will be no gloom and a shadow of death in the world. The Midrash relates the passage from Job to our verses regarding Joseph. Alternatively, the cited verse may also be interpreted as the following. God sets a limit to the darkness. God fixed an amount of time for Yosef for how many years he would exist in the darkness of the prison. Think about if he would have been released from the prison a few days before. Then the dream wouldn't have, it, he never would have interpreted the dream, right? Right? Think about this whole situation. God fixed an amount of time for Yosef for how many years he would exist in darkness in the prison. And once that limit arrived, Pharaoh dreamed a dream setting in motion Yosef's release. Yeah. Hallelujah. And the rabbi says it happened at the end of two years to the day. 
two years. Uh, we'll, we'll get to more of this. Yeah, two years, we'll talk about it a little more. So I want to read something to you. The Midrash is explaining our verse's use of the expression at the end of two years to the day, which suggests the conclusion of the predetermined period of time. According to the Midrash, this term is appropriate because it had been decided that Joseph remained in prison for an additional two years, because he was in before. As a consequence of his misplaced trust in the Chamberlain's, Chamberlain of the cupbearers, and when that time was complete, God caused Pharaoh to have the dream described earlier, which led to Joseph's immediate release. God's hand's all in it. The Midrash application of the verse from Job to Joseph is based on the presence of the root word ketz, for which we get this Torah portion, miketz. In both verses, according to its simple meaning, the verse speaks of righteous people in general, and teaches that God fixes a point and amount of time for how long they will endure suffering. It's interesting, we see this concept, this idea exist all over Scripture. And just on top of my head, I can think of one in Revelation chapter, um, I think it's the beginning of 7. You have this whole multitude of people that go to heaven, and what do they say? They say, how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you come and take care of this stuff on earth? And if you keep reading it, you get the idea of there's a, all in due time. There, hang on a second. You get that idea. Because the people in that book or that verse in Revelation, they recognize there will be a day when it's going to happen. And they're asking them, how long? We see this idea that there is a set, this idea of a set amount of time or a set amount of time left. Anybody have any thoughts before I go on to the next part of this? Because I think you'll have more understanding by the time I'm done than going through some things. Casey, you have a thought? Yes, no, maybe? A thought? No. Yeah. He does? It was two years, yeah. It had, well, I'm going to get to part of that, rest of that part too, the two years. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. That, that part. This is that whole thing we talked about earlier about the, um, about people. You know, uh, you look at the story of Joseph and his brothers. You know, there was still a little game playing back and forth that he didn't reveal himself to his brothers till the right time. Oh, I'm going to keep your brother here as a hostage until you go back. All of this stuff was going back and forth. Um, even w You can even look into it within that situation. There was a time for them to be in darkness as even who he was. Hallelujah. In reading this portion... You get this impression of what transpired. Joseph was sentenced to prison indefinitely, and it was only due to Pharaoh's dream and his need for an interpreter that Joseph gained an early release. Were it not for Pharaoh's dream, Joseph would have remained in prison. It's crazy. According to the rabbis, it is precisely this notion that the Midrash seeks to dispel. And the Midrash gives a completely different perspective on the events of this passage, one rooted in a careful and precise reading of the words. At, it, it says, And it happened at the end of two years, the two-year period after the Chamberlain of the Cupbearer's release was predetermined by God. Those two years completely or completed Joseph's sentence. From the outset, he was never destined to be in prison longer. This is borne out the, by the verse in Job cited that says, He set a limit to the darkness. God had originally restricted Joseph's dark days of imprisonment to a predetermined number of years. When this time was up, Pharaoh had a dream in order to set in motion a chain of events leading to his release. This is the meaning of the verse that says at the end of two years, Pharaoh was dreaming. Now listen to this. This is what it gets really good. The verse wasn't the cause of his release, 
On the contrary, the termination of the predestined time of Joseph's sentence was the cause of the dream that brought about his freedom. The dream was not the cause of his release. On the contrary, the termination of the predestined time of Joseph's sentence was the cause of the dream that brought about his freedom. That makes sense? This teaching has profound implications from our, in our daily lives. It so often happens that people confuse the cause with the effect. For example, there's a successful businessman who becomes wealthy. People assume that his business enterprise is the cause of his wealth. If not for the enterprise, he would never have made a fortune. Yet, in fact, the opposite is true. The man was destined to become rich, therefore God provided him with a lucrative enterprise to make that destiny a reality. It's a totally different way of looking at this. There's also the same author of this, uh, Beis Halevi. He also wrote a small tract of the, on the subject of what is known in Hebrew as uh, bitachon, B-I-T-A-C-H-O-N which means trust in God. And this is the next part of this idea. It adds a further illuminating example. It says, it shows this here. Jacob had made for Joseph a fine woolen tunic. Because of his favoritism, the brothers resented Joseph and subsequently sold him into slavery in Egypt. In the course of events, Jacob and his family descended there too, resulting in the Egyptian exile. Thus, the tunic would seem to be the cause of the exile. Yet this is belied by the fact that the exile was predestined and revealed by God to Abraham in the covenant between the parts. Again, we have here a confusion of cause and effect. In truth, the exile was predestined in order to implement it a chain of events was put into motion beginning with the, wooden, the woolen tunic. Had Jacob not given Joseph the tunic, some other occurrence would have ushered the, in the exile. This is very interesting, in particular for some things that we've been dealing with for a few months. Whenever you get into a situation, do you ever say, what did I do wrong to get into this situation? Is God punishing me for doing something? Is this all just happenstance and it just happened to you fill in the blank? Or is God control over everything and he's doing this to me? You ever have any quite thoughts like that or hear somebody say something like that? And feel as though you never can really get to the uh, understanding of, okay, this is exactly it. I've got the answer right here. I know exactly what it is. I can give you 10 words to describe this situation perfectly, and that's it. You ever get to that point? Or do you always feel like, man, you know, okay, I think I'm pretty sure why this happened, but I, you know, I, I, I don't quite get it yet. I've been working somewhere for 20 plus years, and everything was good. Then out of the blue, I got fired for something I didn't even do. Why, God, are you doing this to me? God, are you trying to get me to do such and such? Instead of looking at it and saying, okay, God, I'm fired now, I lost my job. There must, you have something for me, you're behind this, so whether I got fired today or the factory I worked in burned down next week, or whatever. You can do a whole lot of things you can imagine and put in there and say, all of these things could have enemy got me right here. I'm not asking, why did, I, or why did this happen to get me here? No, so I'm here. You got me here, God, for some reason. I'm not even going to look at why. What are you doing with it? You ever in a relationship and a relationship just ends? And you say, what happened? I didn't do anything. What happened? I could have chosen to leave. 
I could have been kicked out. All of these kind of things, but none of those really matter when you finally say, I'm here. Why am I here, Lord? What, what, where am I going from here? Bitachon, trust in God. What is your level of bitachon, of trusting God? And what is your level of trusting in man? Are they mutually exclusive? No, or they work together like this. Tell me why you say that. All the time throughout the scriptures. Yeah. He says, yeah. Trust in him, trust in me. God says that. Yes. Yes, yes. And, and then there's yeah. times where yeah. uh, he has great plans for various things. Right, and right. Instead of them jumping on board with him, hey, King Kings, the story of the four. Were you here the last when I went to the story of the four kings? I think you missed that. But you were referring exactly to what I taught a couple weeks ago. Yeah. 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 Where it's like. Yeah. Well, let's just say this is what you're talking about. Yeah. What you're talking about this week uh -huh. might really be what I want to. Yeah. Bad poo poo happen in my life, and the good that results. They're resulting in it. it. And if I, the poo poo had not had happened, yeah. I would not have what it is now. Can't you say? Yes. That? Yes. That I've never forgiven myself for. Yes. Got me stoked. And, 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 and uh, yeah. reading about Paul and that, reading about Jerusalem, yeah. I was like, I really get it. So let me ask you this. So even digging deeper into that, when you look at the certain things that you attribute to whatever happened, if you look at what happened and say the Lord got me there and these are the things that brought me there, but it could have been, I could have gotten here a whole bunch of different ways. But that was, right, but a focusing in on the particular thing that happened to get you there, that's really what's coming into play here. Yeah. Is, is that, does it even, in a lot of ways, does that part even matter? Or is it more important to look at where you are that he got you there? You're and right, then what, yeah. yeah. And then you mentioned about the trusting in horses, this and that. But at the same time, when they went out to war, did they walk? No, so they weren't trusting that the horse was God but they used that horse to go to war kind of thing. That makes sense. So this whole idea of it's always like this. And the idea is how much are you, how, what's the level of your bit of home, your trust in God, and your use of people? Should they work together? Yes. I still trust God to yeah. be um, Yes. That's full trust. Well, let me. So, I'm not there, but yeah. I got. Well, let me ask you about this. Is real good stuff you're bringing up here. Let me ask you something about that. A baby can only trust. His, a baby has to trust his mother because he has nothing else. Yeah. But a baby, you don't trust in your mother when you're 20. No. Why not? Because now there's expectations of you. So your level of avodah, your level of what you need to do is different. You're still trusting God in a different way. So the whole idea is to recognize where you are and really in a lot of ways not even necessarily look back at how you got there because it doesn't matter because God could have got you there a bunch of different ways. You know, we, when I see myself here today and I saw the journey it took to get us here, 20, uh, 25 plus year journey from all the way from San Diego through, you know, Riverside County to here. And if I can tell you the story of how we got here and how I got here, it's crazy, but at the same time, that doesn't mean that that was the only way. There could have been a lot of ways could have gotten me here because really some of the route that God really, I believe he wanted me on specifically, we detoured, but he ended up getting me to the same place just via a detour. He's a good teacher and he's full of patience and uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't stop until he, he's going to do whatever he can do to get you to the place where he's trying to get you to you know, that you could have got there when you were 20 and now you're 50 and you finally arrived. But you got there, right? We get people all the time say, hey, I'm going to come to service. I'm going to come to service. I'm going to come. Okay. When you get here, I'll be happy to greet you when you're here. Sometimes they come right away. Sometimes it takes a long time. Sometimes you see people leave to move and you think, oh, man, they're going to come back every couple months and visit. And then years pass. But then you reach the day when they're back. Does it really matter the other stuff back there? 
or you in the moment in that day saying, it's Shabbat, we're going to praise God today and thank Him for it. And so this week I can move on into what's next. Forgetting those things which are behind and pressing forward, right? Same kind of idea. These are Jewish ideas. They're not, this wasn't an idea that Paul just made up. You know, I've got a new sermon series I'm teaching this Sunday, and it's called Forgetting What Is Behind. And he taught that at the first, you know, Messianic community on Bethlehem Road and Jerusalem Drive. No, these were Jewish things that had understanding that went way back, way back. So let me finish reading. This is really good. Um, trying to see where did I leave off here. Yeah, let's see. Let's see. Okay, okay. I'm if I read this, I'm rereading it. So again, we have here a confusion of cause and effect. In truth, the exile was predestined, and in order to implement it, a chain of events was put into motion, beginning with the woolen tunic. Had Jacob not given Joseph the tunic, some other occurrence would have ushered in the exile. The author of uh, Beit HaLevi concludes that a person should not be concerned regarding the success or failure of any enterprise because in any case, it is not the enterprise that yields the results. The results are determined by God and will come to pass one way or, uh, one way or the other. This is the power, powerful lesson of our Midrash. And I've got a couple more things I want to. Rabbi Shimon Bar Abba said, in, in all toil, there will be gain. What's he talking about? Remember I asked you this question about, well, what happens? Does it matter what Joseph did while he was in the pit? Yes. Let's talk about the good that he did. What was one of the good things he did? He interpreted the dream. What is looked upon as the negative thing he did? He was relying on man to get him out too much. And both, both of them bore fruit. Some of the fruit, the bad fruit, he stayed there for two more years. The good fruit, he interpreted the dream at least and helped the people get out. And it's another lesson. You can help a lot of people do a lot of things, and regardless if they ever acknowledge it, God still sees, and you still did the mitzvah, right? Because that's it. Do the mitzvah, and your reward isn't your reward is to be able to do another mitzvah. Well, let me read this to you here, and I'm way over time, but I want to uh, read this last part here. This part talks about the benefits of all that he went through. So alternatively, the cited verse may be interpreted as follows. In all the pain, there will be gain. Joseph eventually derived benefit from all the suffering that he endured from his master's wife. Why was it beneficial? Because as a result of that suffering, he took her daughter as a wife. I mentioned that earlier. And the rabbis talked about this idea, but the talk of the lips brings only loss. Mitzvah is doing. Mitzvah has nothing to do with ever saying. You know, you're starving to death and someone says they're going to bring you food and they don't show up and you just die. Totally different than you're starving to death and somebody doesn't say anything at all and they show up at your home with food and you live. Two different things. But talk of the lips brings only loss. On account of that which Joseph said to the chamberlain of the cupbearers, if only you would, two things he said, think of me and mention me to Pharaoh, two years were added for him to his incarceration. As it stated, it happened at the end of two years to the day. In, in Hebrew, it gives the understanding two years to the day. The last thing I want to show you, if you guys have any questions or thoughts, please let me know. We've learned that 
Potiphar was actually Joseph's master. And the rabbis thought that it was due to this, his supreme efforts to avoid sinning with his master's wife, that Joseph merited to take her daughter. If he would have done anything with the wife, he wouldn't be able to marry the daughter, clearly. And the daughter was superior to the mother. It was originally decreed that Joseph would spend 10 years in prison as a result of the comments he made to his father regarding his 10 brothers. Also cited, uh, a few different people cited that. Well, because he made two requests demonstrating reliance on a human being as opposed to God, Joseph was in prison for an additional two years. This alone right there ought to make you not continue to be careful about what you say. Does that mean we should never rely on someone else or ask someone for help? No, it's not saying that either. But we've talked about this idea that doesn't really exist so much in Western Christian thought, this idea of kavanah, your heart condition. You can say a lot of things without the right heart condition and do them, and they really don't account for a whole lot. You ever have someone apologize to you? They're really, really sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I wrecked your car. I'm sorry. I'm done. That's it. I, I'm sorry. D does that tell you that they're really sorry? You can tell the condition. You can see the condition of their heart doesn't seem very uh, um, remorseful at all. Remember Yeshua, he talked about Kavanaugh when he told, um, I can't remember which group he was talking to, but he said, oh, no, I'm sorry, I take that back. I'm talking about, um, let's see, which, let me get this verse right. Oh, excuse me. Yochanan the Immerser, John the Baptist, when they came up to see him and he said, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? And what did he tell him to do? He said, bring forth sacrifices worthy of repentance. Or basically what he's saying is do something outwardly that shows me your insides have changed. You can't go to the, you, you can't, you know, Yeshua talked about, you know, if you have odd against your brother, don't come and bring an offering to the temple. First go there and get that right. He's seen the things that are inside. But let me finish this up here. Without a doubt, Joseph relied on God to provide a salvation. He was nonetheless punished because he enlisted the participation of a human in arranging his release. The Midrash is pointing out that the verse measures two years from the time that Joseph made his request of the chamberlain to the cupbearers because Yosef would have been released that much earlier were not for the comments he made. And look at the ripple effect this would have had. So who knows what would have happened with the dream of Pharaoh? Who knows what would have happened with the famine? How long they would have had to prepare? All of these things, they hinge it upon that one quick conversation he had with the cupbearer. I'm over time. You guys, you give me a little more time to read something to you. Let me see. I want to pick something real good. Rabbi Heim Brisker once posed the following question to a young student of his, the future Rabbi Shimon Shkop. Had Joseph made only one request from the chamberlain of his cupbearers, how many years would he have been added to his term in prison? Okay. Rabbi Shimon answered that since two requests were punishable with two years of imprisonment, it follows that the one request would have been for one year. Make sense? But Rabbi Haim said no. Rather, had Joseph made only one request, he would have not been liable at all and nothing would have been added to his term in, of imprisonment. Rabbi Haim based his assertion on the explanation of his father, the author of Bes Halevi. He presented below an insight to note levels of trust. There are levels to these things. You can't expect people who don't know the Lord like you do to trust in the same way you do. As he explained, Joseph was punished for excessive reliance on the chamberlain. Is it possible that such, such excess was expressed only in his double request? Had he made only a single request for the chamberlain, it might have been deemed good and proper, but he would not have been punished at all. 
However, by making the double request, Joseph overstepped the bounds of, permitted ende of the uh, permitted endeavor. Two requests for a man like Joseph demonstrated a momentary laxity of his bitachon or his trust and reliance on God. Momentary. Scripture tells us that you will be judged by every word that comes out of your mouth. It's the same idea. Gauged by Joseph's standard, his trust was at that moment misplaced. He had placed his trust in a mortal chamberlain rather than in God. And according to the set of requests, was not performed with the lofty motives expected from Joseph. Is there more expected of a tzaddik, of a righteous man, than just a common, regular? Yeah. He had slipped from his, his pinnacle of trust, his bitachon, and bless you, and was punished for both requests, one for each year. The verse includes or that the two comments for which Joseph is censured by a midrash reads as follows. If only you would think of me yourself when, you, when he benefits you, and you will do me a kindness. If you please and mention me to Pharaoh, then you would take me out of this building. Another rabbi makes an observation, says Joseph made a third request, which was, and then you will take me out of this building. In addition to this two-sided here, why then was he punished for only two when he made three? There's a lot of discussion went into this. Joseph's release from prison took place on Rosh Hashanah. It follows that his conversation with the chamberlain of the cupbearers exactly two years earlier was also on that holy day, which is commonly referred to as the Day of Remembrance. It is a day upon which people are remembered by God and therefore the time for them to request of him that he remembered them for good. For this reason, Joseph was punished for each of the two requests he made of a human being that included remembrance. His punishment was that two Rosh Hashanahs, two days of remembrance, went by which Joseph was forgotten, as it were, by God. And I'm going to leave it right there unless anyone has any thoughts. The expectation God has upon each of us is different. The call he has is different. And we all need to know what that is individually. Because if you don't, there's not a man can get you out of situations that God doesn't want you out of. you in a, in a pit and you're praying to God to get you out? But at the same time, you're asking men to do things and you're not connected with what God is telling you. On, the, on a particular day, when it's the day to remember God and to. Father, we thank you and praise you for this time we've had together, Lord. And just like Joseph, as he was in the pit, we're reminded, Lord, of Mashiach, O oh God, who rescues all of us from all, from all the pits that we find ourselves in, O oh God. And we're reminded, Lord, today as we celebrate the seventh day of Hanukkah and we light the menorah, showing the, just the light of Messiah into the darkness around us, O oh God. We pray, Lord, that we would learn from this, that we would learn from what the rabbis um, said caused Joseph two more years in prison. We would learn to trust in you and not put our faith and trust and hope in a man. That we would learn, O oh God, to keep our... Um, our hearts turn to you, that the kavanah of our heart would always be turned towards you, O God, and not trusting in anyone but you, O God. And we ask you to give us the wisdom to understand the difference, O God, where these things overlap, where they meet, where they need to be separated, all those things. So we thank you and praise you for all of this, O God, and we ask as we continue this service of celebrating Hanukkah, Lord, that we would just focus our eyes on the light of Messiah. We thank you and praise you for all of this in Yeshua's name, Lord. Amen and amen. Hallelujah.